Hi, and welcome back to another edition of Casual Conversations. My name is Brennan DePost, social media producer for Columbia University's surgery department. And I am here with Dr. Oz. How are you doing today, Dr. Doing Oz? Well. I am so happy to be sitting with you. Thank you so much for taking the time with us. We know you are super busy. <laughs> um, so for you to uh, spend a little time with me, I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in with my first question. Um, what first interested you in becoming a doctor? I remember I was seven years old. And my dad and I were in the ice cream parlor. And the kid in front of me you know, was waiting for his ice cream. He was probably 10. At that age, that's a big difference. And my dad asked the guy, kid pretty innocently, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the kid said, I don't know, which was not an unreasonable answer at age 10. And the kid got his ice cream you know, and walked around. We were next to the line. And my dad looked at me and said, I don't care what you do in life, but I never want to hear that answer. Hmm. His point was that you needed to have something to be in you for, even at age 7. You could change your mind. That's your flexibility. You know, It's your life to live. But decide what you want to be. I had that moment thought I'd be a doctor. My dad's a physician. I watched him go into hospitals and I was aware of the fact that although he was causing pain, mm -hmm. he was bringing them help and they were blessed and, and, and appreciative of what he was doing. And it caught my attention that you could do things that on the surface you wouldn't want to do to somebody else, like do surgery on them, but bring them joy because they were healing from a problem they otherwise couldn't have sur surmounted. And I never changed my mind from wanting to be a doctor. And the more I learned about it, the more I realized it was my calling. It's still my passion. I still practice medicine today, despite having a television show for the last uh, decade. Because I know when I come to the hospital, like I am here today, I get to look in people's eyes. I connect. Because I know that there's a purpose for why I'm here. And I feel that they are appreciative of that. And frankly, on the television show, I just try to capture that blissful moment that all doctors have. When they're in the presence of someone else, they know they can live. Mm, that's amazing. Um, my next question is, why did you specifically choose Columbia University Medical Center? So Columbia was an easy choice for me because it wasn't my choice. <laughs> it was my wife's choice. <laughs> Little known secret. Okay. <laughs> you heard it here for the first time. Okay. <laughs> Breaking news. Okay. So um, I had gone to Harvard. Okay. Undergrad. I played football. And okay. I was all caught up in that. My dad only knew one college. Okay. You know, but he, my parents are Turkish. Okay. And in, okay. In, okay. in Turkey at the time, Harvard's name was, was a pretty well-known name because the medical center was so influential. My dad had gone to medical school at a time when a lot of the physicians had come from other countries to Turkey. And so when, you know, when I was a little kid growing up, uh, he would always hammer me uh, that I wanted to go to a top school and get educated because it was important, like most immigrant families. And we don't, we're not fair to immigrants, I think, oftentimes in, in, in modern-day America. We don't appreciate, obviously, we're all immigrants here, but the average immigrant creates four jobs. The average immigrant went to college, 52%, unlike uh, you know, the, the many expectations. Um, but I was a typical immigrant's kid, and so he pushed, 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 and I had gone to college in Boston. I ended up going to medical school at Penn okay. because they had a joint degree program with Wharton Business School, mm -hmm. and I wanted to understand how money played a role in medicine. Mm. And so I had those two institutions as my choices, and my wife said, well, hold on a second. I want to be an actor. <laughs> and yeah. she, in fact, you know the advising commercials yeah, with the bloodshot yeah. eyes? Those yeah. are my wife's eyes. Oh, wow. So so she said, you got to be in New York, so pick a place in New York. And I said, well, I, mean, I really like Columbia. I just never thought of New York as so intimidating. It's a big city. Right. I never lived in a big city like right. New York. I don't know if I can weather it. And I came to visit, and uh, there was a woman, Kathy McNichols is her name. She's one of the first female heart surgeons. Wow. She was my father-in-law's, Lisa's father's partner. Oh, okay. And she was the one that kept saying, go to Columbia. You know, there's just some really iconic people there. It's a it's a fairly free flowing institution. Culturally, you'll fit in because they're not all regimented. Right. They're gonna get you know they they know what it's like to be innovative and out of the box. And I came to the institution to interview. I fell in love. I met a gentleman named Keith Reeves, who was my chairman. And Keith was the person many apocryphally say was the character upon whom Hawkeye was based mm -hmm. in okay. the show Mash. Yeah. Okay. Now that okay. time stand up was a guy Frank Spencer, who was a chairman that. NYU was more like Frank Burns. Mm -hmm. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. I asked Alan all the years later. He hadn't heard the story, but that's what I thought because <laughs> that's okay. what I was told. Right, right, right. right. And, and Keith Reeves' favorite line was, I'll give you enough rope to do whatever you want to do. Just don't, don't hang yourself. Okay. And years later when uh, Dr. Reeves was dying of liver cancer, he took me back to where he grew up among the missionaries, among the Navajos in New Mexico and took me around the part of the country where he first was exposed to America. He'd been the provost of Utah during the most uh, uh, disruptive times in American history, potentially in the late 60s when the students were rioting. And he felt passionately about true education being about giving people freedom to learn, freedom to say things that were not what you might agree with but needed to be said. And that colored my impression of this institution. It was culturally 
together with Tom King, his program director, what he built here. And I tell you, I don't think I would have done nearly what I've accomplished in life if it wasn't for the freedom that they gave me and the, the expectation that young people could contribute to the advancement of medicine. Something that we often forget thinking you've got to know a lot before right. you do something. Right. Some of the best ideas come from young people who are seeing it for the first time. Right. In fact, one of the things that I'm most proud of in my own career is the development of mechanical heart devices, LVADs. Mm -hmm. So much of the actual operation came from young people who saw the procedure with new eyes and said, why are you cutting over there? Mm. And I'd say, I actually don't know why I'm cutting over here. I mean, I guess I could cut over here. In fact, it's pretty fast if I do it this way. Maybe I'll just change and do this. Mm -hmm. And that evolution of the procedure allowed this institution to become the premier bad placement uh, group in the country because we learn from the young ones. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So my final question for you is, what is the most rewarding part of your job? So you talked a lot about some of the, the things that you've kind of gone through in life. There's no question that the most important, the, the most rewarding part of what I do yeah. is the same thing that I think most doctors would have, which is the ability to connect with people at a whole different level. You know, you go to a cocktail party, you meet people, have a good time, right. you add them on a right. bag, right. catch up, we'll do lunch. Right. Uh, you, you get into deep relationships with patients because it's big stakes. And the ability to focus energetically and emotionally on one single goal to make that person better, and your God-given ability, and I do think that we have to respect for the fact that we're given these tools, we need to use them for the right reasons, that's special. And I always tell young people who are considering medicine that no matter what you might hear about reimbursement, about practice, or lack of respect, this is the best job in the world. Mm. There is no question about that. And I've been all over this world, my shows in 100 countries. Wow. I've seen the same thing among doctors everywhere. I also respect that having worked in other fields, as much as I adore and what, what I can, can contribute there, it's different when you actually sit in front of someone holding their hand, looking them in the eyes, and agreeing on a course of action that's going to make a difference. Mm. Dr. Hollis, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome.